Hello and welcome to ORF's discussion on Afghanistan today. It has been 20 years since the September 11 attacks in the United States forced Washington and its allies into Afghanistan, leading to the collapse of the Taliban regime. After that, as we know, Western nations have focused their efforts on rebuilding the nation, propping up a flawed yet democratic government, a weak but functioning economy, and building and supporting de development projects in the country that they hoped would no longer be used by terrorists or militants. Now, exactly two decades later, it has been over three weeks since the Taliban marched into Kabul and the Afghan government as we knew it collapsed completely. With the Taliban announcing the men who will form their interim government, ORF's report, the Kabul dossier, highlighted the profiles of 22 men who will play a crucial role in shaping the new power structure in the country. Many of the Taliban leaders on the list are already declared to be part of the new government in some capacity or the other, while others will continue to play an important role behind the scenes. Today, our discussion will focus on this new government in Kabul, its likely relationship with Pakistan moving forward, and what the coming to power of the Taliban means, of course, for India. We are joined by an excellent panel. We have Ruchi Kumar, who is a journalist who has been reporting on the conflict for a number of years. Uh, she has a keen understanding of dynamics in the country as she was in Kabul for a while. We have Kabir Paneja, who is a fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. We have Dr. Avinash Paliwal, who is a senior lecturer at SOAS and is the deputy director of the South Asia Institute at SOAS, the University of London. We are also joined by Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay, who has served as former ambassador to Afghanistan, Syria and Myanmar. Thank you all for joining us today. Kabir, if I could just start with you. Um, what do you make of the Taliban's announcement of the members of their interim government? Some surprises, some names that we had expected. Could you sort of just put into perspective what the names on the list mean and tell us about what sort of government that would mean for the Taliban? Uh, yeah, thanks, Riti. I think, uh, look, uh, some of the names were expected and some were maybe not expected, which was uh, overall uh, uh, sort of well expected that it's going to be a mixed bag at some level. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, in the sense that uh, it's uh, it's uh, the fact that they announced it late last night uh, was a little strange because uh, they had uh, suggested that they're going to announce this kind of uh, this uh, interim government later in the in the week. But I think the Kabul protests and protests in other part of the countries and calls for protests from uh, from uh, the leaders in Panchir Valley uh, sort of, uh, you know, push this uh, uh, this announcement from the Taliban's perspective. Um, but overall, look, it's uh, it's it's the return of the, the power centers that were with the Taliban in the 90s, right? So a lot of the people that are involved right at the top are still in and around from the same frame, same framework that was prevalent in the 90s. So uh, at a certain level, uh, I think a lot of people that were expecting I don't know why, but they were expecting a certain amount of change in the Taliban. The whole Taliban 2.0 uh, narrative that was created uh, has been sort of now pushed away. Right? It it is uh, at a certain level uh, a, uh, a a you know the Taliban sort of uh, uh, pushing itself first to maintain uh, uh, the the Taliban organization, mm -hmm. and then the governance comes into play. So right now they are. Um, uh, they have uh, built an interim government and first of all we don't know what an interim government means from their perspective when it's going to change how is it going to change because if you see the power center right now it seems pretty uh, pretty concrete uh, from from where we are sitting so uh, f first of all we don't know that that what an interim government's definition is from the taliban perspective and the second this is this is the taliban you know doubling down on its insurgency this is not the taliban forming the government so to speak this is the Taliban appointing themselves to government positions as an insurgency, first and foremost. And then, of course, at some level, they're going to have to function as a as a state and a government because uh, there are 35 million citizens in the country that will require some sort of um, you know, political clarity on what, what awaits. So uh, as far as the list goes, you know, it's... Uh, as far as the list goes, uh, they, there have been... Uh, I think it's covered fairly well. Uh, the most of the most of the uh, leaders appointed are sort of old school Pashtuns that have been involved with the Taliban insurgency since since its inception. But we have seen some sort of uh, uh, people that uh, have succeeded more for the Taliban in the north 
the north is a part that uh, uh, that uh, was not the stronghold of the taliban in the 90s but the way that it sort of fell over the past couple of uh, months we've seen some of the leaders that led that charge from the taliban perspective get uh, plush uh, positions within the military apparatus of 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 the taliban government so that's a very sort of very quick take on 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 what is yet to still unravel in the next couple of weeks on how this is actually going to function so ruchi like kabir is saying that you know the taliban is sort of just appointing themselves as insurgents to government positions we know that Uh, the Taliban today is no longer the Islamic Emirate of 1996. We know that Afghanistan today is not the same of 1996. But there have been some discussions about what type of government the Taliban could form. Some have said that it could model the Iranian style of government. Some said that it could model the Saudi style of government. So, what sort of strange hybrid government structure or nature of government do you think that we can expect in the coming weeks, or is it still too soon to tell? Well, uh, I think one of the reasons why Taliban um, struggled for at least a few weeks to decide what's going, who's going to be in their government, or what their government is going to look like, because they kept using the word inclusive a lot over the over months. In fact, uh, about how what kind of transitional government they want, and you know the kind of political settle they want, settlement they want, which was they wanted it to be inclusive. But I think the reason that they struggled in the last few weeks is because they did not expect the victory that they actually. face they were not prepared they were not themselves prepared uh for 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 getting this much power in this short time like and it was very clear the, in the way they managed um a lot of the governance or security so uh, so to speak um and uh, i think which is why they need they they thought they pro- or at least this is the impression that i get and and you know people i talk to that they get that they and they thought they had a little more time to figure out what the what the word inclusive means for them what the word governance mean, means for them because they are still not decided on how they want to pursue um uh, what kind of government they want to want to pursue uh, like kabir said of course the the reason they announced it in the, the week they did it sounded rushed but i think the reason they did it is because there was a mounting pressure uh, from the resistance there was mounting protest those mounting you know um uh, the whole idea of governance was uh, there was no government basically so there was no way to uh, for for them to even mobilize their own fighters who are now in the cities or how to you know um uh, delegate uh, uh delegate duties so i think this is a very rushed job but they will at some point sit down and i'm sure they're doing that right now to sit down and and build an actual framework which again i don't believe will be very exclusive because this what we are seeing right now um the 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 frame the the cabinet that we are seeing right now is going to be the foundation of the next if this is what i believe is going to be the foundation of the inclusive government that they they hope to to create um i don't know how long or what, it, those those details are not not very clear but uh, um but some things are are uh, some things are very evident like you know they will give a lot of uh, importance to the mujahideen fighters a lot of to the uh, their allies the haqqani network these these people will we will see them again in in whatever the next version of the government that they are going to set up um what kind of a government that will be is is still it it still needs to be seen but like some there are some evidence like it will definitely not be democratic they are again they've been against election there will definitely not be many women leaders in fact i'll be surprised if there were even one because they do not believe in women's leadership positions uh, which minorities get uh, which minorities get space in the government is also remains to be seen like for this government uh this this temporary interim government they, there are there are clearly no minorities there are no hazara leaders even though there are uh shia groups that have allied with them and they still didn't manage to secure a place in their interim government so i feel like a lot of these questions they will need to answer or they need to they probably will figure out on their own and if like it still remains to be seen is is what but this gives us an idea of what what we can expect in the coming weeks or months so sure. the taliban you know they've talked a lot about how what you said that they want an in- inclusive government they're trying to make the world believe that they have changed that they're moderate taliban 2.0 that entire spiel um, but abinash how are the taliban trying to or are they even trying to um, have policies domestic policies that can help um, sort of bring the country together or are they going to continue uh, to rule by this politics of fear um i mean that's been successful for them as an insurgent movement but now that they're in government how are they planning 
uh, if they are planning to win over the population that they plan to rule, given the number of different problems that Afghanistan faces today. Kriti, thank you for having me here and thank you for the question. I think they're very clearly, at least among certain leaders of the Taliban, you know, who, some of whom are in this interim cabinet of sort, there is a realization that they need to work on a new sort of social contract between the Taliban, and, uh, uh, which has come to control the state apparatus and the citizens of Afghanistan. And I think you can see at least a PR campaign being led where uh, individuals like Mullah Basik is going, you know, hugging babies on the streets of Kabul. But let's be very clear. There is no clarity within the Taliban, in, in the Taliban's leadership, as to how to govern. They use the idea of Sharia. They use the idea of, you know, whatever basic brass stack formations of, a, of an executive body can be formed and is being formed. Uh, that's really, really very minimal in governing a country as diverse, both ethnically, religiously, and, you know, in various other social indicators, such a diverse and big country like Afghanistan. So I think in reality, despite having this appreciation for trying to be inclusive, I don't think they are capable of being that inclusive. I think that's a very serious handicap. That's an internal, intrinsic handicap to the Taliban. It's an ideological handicap. It's also a handicap that comes when you have been an insurgent force for most of the past two, you know, for 20 years. And even before that, let's not forget, between 1996 and 2001, they didn't have control over the entire of Afghanistan throughout that period, right? The high point was in 1998. Uh, and still they were struggling to capture, you know, to run their writ in Panjshir at that point in time. So I don't think they're capable of that kind of governance that people are expecting. They're, I don't think they're capable of inclusivity uh, of that sort. I think the only inclusivity for them right now is to make sure that they're able to contain in fighting and the internal fissures don't turn violent and lead to collapse, uh, imminent collapse of whatever little they have been able to stitch together. Uh, and that too has happened uh, with support from the ISI. There is no doubt about that, right? You can see very clearly that uh, it took a very public visit of the chief of ISI to actually figure out who would be what to put people like Mullah Baradar and to put Abbas Tanakzai in place because they were seen as being a bit more open or moderate or have demonstrating some independent agency in dealing with the world through Doha. Everyone who Pakistan believes has some autonomous streak within the Taliban has been completely deputi deputized, right? Uh, and most of the senior members in the cabinet are at least 50% of this cabinet is Kandahari. Uh, the rest of it is from Loya Paktia, then a few Shamalis, two Tajiks, and one Uzbek. So you just think about, you know, this is not inclusive. This is a, a cabinet which will be very easy for, which will be very prone to manipulation mm -hmm. in the coming years. And I don't foresee any meaningful effort uh, in moderation. Why? There is no incentive for them to moderate. Absolutely not. You don't come, you don't defeat a superpower in your own mind after a 20 year long war, perhaps longer for most of them, and then change your basic core principles and ideology. That's not how power politics works. Would you say that's one of the reasons that uh, Mullah Hassan Akhund has been elected prime minister because of his sort of lack of popular support or not being, not having a base, um, so to say? He's not elected, uh, Kriti. Sorry, he's installed, not, of course, installed. He's, he's, installed. he's been, he's been He's been appointed, and I don't think he doesn't have a base. I think he actually does have a base. He was part of the court 30 people, court 30 mullahs, mullah who actually formed the Taliban in uh, 1994. And he traditionally is seen as an elder within the movement. He does not have a base. He might not have access to guns and money, you know, lush funds of his own, or might ha not have independent ambitions, perhaps. But he's largely accepted as a senior figure. And I it's highly unlikely that uh, many Talibs would go against uh, his, his, uh, his kind of, you know, what he has to say in terms of policies. But also the, uh, the fact is um, he is quite dependent in his own existence to external support. Yeah. Right, the traditional, the traditional core. He has been the chief of the Rehberi Shura forever, almost, and Rehberi Shura operated from Quetta. So this is a guy with whom both the Pakistani establishment and the Talibs have some degree of, you know, comfort. You can deal with him, you can influence him, you can kind of, you know, impress your ideas on him. Doesn't mean he doesn't have his own mind, but it's a mind which is prone to 
prone to, uh, you know, is receptive to certain kind of ideas and influences. And perhaps that's why he is there. That's why he's been seen as a go between the Kandaharis and the Haqqanis, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a kind of a compromise figure. So it will be, it's classic Afghan state, a weak central institution and a weak central personality surrounded by a lot of power brokers. This is something actually, uh, this is a aspect of structural continuity between Afghanistan of the past and Afghanistan of the present. And I'm, when I say the past, I'm talking about, you know, post Second World War Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Um, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, Avinash brings up the ISI and their role. How much, in, I mean, in 1996, it can be argued that, you know, of course, the Taliban owed the ISI everything. How do you see the relationship uh, with the Taliban evolving uh, with the ISI now, ISI now, now that the Taliban has greater international legitimacy, uh, they've made their own relations with other nations, such as Russia, China. Uh, do you think do you see a certain pushback that they might give the ISI, or how do you see it uh, evolving from here on? Yeah, thank you, uh, Kritika. Firstly, I think uh, I largely agree with you know all my uh, fellow panelists and what they have said. Uh, if you know, I'll make a little distinction between Taliban 1.0, Taliban 2.0, which is the period that I say is between 2001 and 21, and I would actually prefer to call the present one 3.0 in waiting. Uh, mm -hmm. The difference is this, that Taliban 1.0 was not actually a terrorist force. It was a socially conservative religious militia that imposed its will on the Afghan people by force with the support of Afghanistan, of Pakistan. Second, you know, I can tell you one thing because I came there in November 2001. I saw how Afghanistan was in the period 1996 to, to 2001. Uh, in the period leading up to 1996, you know, there was a lot of destruction. If Kabul can be taken as a kind of epitome, uh, the intra mujahideen fighting had left a lot of destruction. Uh, the Pakistanis and the Taliban in those five, six years did absolutely no reconstruction, no development. And I think that was the Pakistani plan to actually keep Afghanistan so backward, so poor and so completely dependent on them that they would be you know, they, they would be basically helpless. Difference this time is that the Taliban and Pakistan, actually, again, you know, the hand of Pakistan is very much there. I think the hand of ISI in this period between 2001 and 21, 2.0 has actually grown because it was it's, it is in this period that they have radicalized. It is in this period that they have become a terrorist force. It is this period that they have acquired and developed, you know, developed suicide tactics, bombs, vehicles, IEDs and so on. Uh, and all this has been done in very heavy dependence on uh, the ISI. Take two or three simple examples. Take the case of uh, Mullah Baradar. You know, when we talk about a certain degree of independence of elements or factions of the Taliban from the ISI, take the fact of Mullah Baradar, eight years in a Pakistan in Pakistani jail, in a Pakistani caught in a Pakistani sting operation. Uh, he is revived and used for the uh, for the negotiations with the US. Uh, he was psychologically and physically, from what I hear, uh, rip, uh, broken down during that period. We have not heard a whimper of a protest from any rank within the Taliban about the treatment made it out to Baradar. You cannot expect Baradar to suddenly now become a lion, you know, after the kind of treatment he has been meted out. Uh, take another case, uh, Mullah Baradar, two years uh, dead, uh, you know, no uh, leak of his uh, death or, you know, Circum conditions or circumstances in which he died uh, uh, during that period from within the Taliban. Mullah Haibatullah, you know, a reclusive figure, nobody apart from a photograph. Uh, and of course, we know that he's a real figure because uh, he used to preach at a, uh, at a mosque. Uh, but, you know, we are basically when we are dealing with the Taliban, we are dealing with spokespersons. We are dealing with deputy leaders. We are never seeing the masterminds. We are never seeing the puppet uh, string uh, masters. Uh, and I have no uh, reason to doubt that that continues now too, at least at this stage. Now, it is possible that with time, uh, you know, elements will chafe, elements will distance. Pakistan is prepared for that because, you know, they've had the experience of the intra of the Mujahideen, the Seven Party Alliance and so on. So they will just make sure that even if one of these factions deviates or diverges or departs in any way, that there'll be other factions to bring it down. Uh, of course, at this point of time, their pet horse is the Haqqanis. Uh, but uh, don't be surprised if they have other pet horses 
uh, on the side as well. So at this point of time, I would say that essentially this is a military cabinet. It is a war cabinet. As Kabir said, it's, it's a sign that the insurgency will continue. I basically see it as a sign that the jihad will continue. Uh, the jihad will continue within Afghanistan to purge uh, what they regard are, uh, are uh, you know, the vestiges of foreign influence. And the jihad will continue outside because these are highly intertwined with uh, not only international terrorist outfits like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, but a whole panoply, a whole panorama of regional outfits who have been fighting in the trenches together for the last 20 years. Whether it's Etim, uh, IMU, Hizbut Tahrir, or the Lashkaret Taiba, Jhangvi, Sipare Sahiba, the anti Shia groups, Jundullah, any one of them. Uh, so actually, I think we should be prepared. And you know, they've cocked a snoop. They have included four of the five Guantanamo five uh, in security positions in the cabinet. Uh, uh, and, and, and as uh, I think again Kabir pointed out, they've rewarded essentially the military commanders. So I don't see any moderation in this. Mm -hmm. I don't see any, uh, you know, any, even gesture, even though they should be at their good behavior right now. I don't even see a gesture at the so-called Western community that they are going to compromise. If anything, I see that they have doubled down uh, in their uh, in their ideology and their militancy. And how do you see, if you see the a change in their relationship um, with the ISI, or how do you see the appointment uh, of Siraj Akhani as Interior Minister? What does that mean? For Taliban's resources, particularly towards the east, towards the Pakistan border. Yeah. Uh, so right now, I see the Haqqani is being rewarded um, in every way. And by the way, this is also something that the Americans have supported. Uh, as you know, from February to 2020, when they were about to sign the U.S. Taliban deal, the United States has gone out of the way to project Anas Haqqani and Siraj Uddin uh, Haqqani as future leaders of uh, Afghanistan. They have been given media projection. They have been given. Uh, uh, you know, space in the New York Times. They've been given every opportunity to make over. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, of the three factions, let's call it the political commission, the political commission is there to project a good face. It has the prime minister, you know, it has uh, Hassan Akhund, it has Brother, it has Stanik Zayn, the foreign ministry. These are the people who are, you know, have a diplomatic polish and sophistication now by the standards of the time. Uh, but if you see, you know, if you see the propaganda department, if you see the information department, if you see the interior, the uh, NDS, uh, the defense department, uh, Mullah Yaqub may have problems with, uh, sorry, excuse me, Mullah Yaqub may have problems with Haqqani, uh, but he's very much a hardliner when it comes to uh, the military aspects. Uh, so between the three factions, I would say Haqqani, Yaqub, and the political faction, I would say Haqqani is a, a top dog at the moment. Mm -hmm. Kabir, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay has been talking about how you have these different factions and there's been a lot of discussion, particularly before the Taliban came to power, about how these different factions within the Taliban, there was an idea that, you know, they're not very united. There are groups that you can uh, sort of coerce to do what you need to. And it's very difficult for the group to maintain this sort of um, ideological cohesiveness. What are your thoughts on the group's unity today? How do you view... Um, the different ideological factions playing a role, uh, sort of trying to secure their interests in uh, deciding what the nature of the government would be. Yeah, I think, look, one thing that is going to happen in the next couple of months is exactly this, that the other factions that are, let's say, non-Pashtuns and non-pro-Pakistan, uh, not pro-ISI, are going to try and consolidate in one way or the other. Even if, you know, the Taliban is sort of dealing with them in fairly uh, normal ways at this point of time. And, you know, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay said something very interesting about, you know, that the Taliban is not even, you know, trying to give good gestures at this point of time, especially when they announced the cabinet. And one of the best examples of that is how Iran reacted after the cabinet was, was announced. You know, the, you know, you have to remember that before the cabinet was announced, Iran actually pandered to the Taliban a fair bit. They, they invited some of the Taliban leaders uh, into, uh, into Iranian territory. You know, when the Ashura celebrations are happening, the Taliban provided them with uh, with protection in uh, by, by saying that, you know, that the that the Shia Azaras are actually going to get uh, uh, political representation at some level, which is not, which is beyond these sort of uh, um, you know, provinces and uh, on, on a national level. And none of that actually actually happened. And the reaction to that from the Iranian thing, uh, Iranian uh, point of view has been twofold. The first is, of course, that Ibrahim Raisi, uh, the new president of Iran, is now supposed to go to his first foreign uh, visit to Tajikistan. 
uh, and the second is uh, uh, and the second is that uh, uh, the the foreign minister of iran you know today called hamid karzai uh, to voice his concern and this is despite the fact that the taliban announced a foreign minister and a deputy foreign minister and the fact that iran has good relation with people like stanik zai before that but he chose but they chose to actually reach out to uh, reach out to hamid karzai that's first and the second is of course when we are talking about the reaction of the people who have actually not been representative in represented in this um, quote unquote cabinet which is a military cabinet as ambassador mukwade correctly said is that you know the this is sort of a, a an opportunity to market a sort of anti uh, anti uh, you know pan pashtunism that the that the, the taliban has sort of uh, put in, in in place as uh, as a power center right mm-hmm. so uh, other organizations uh, can sort of use this now to uh, to collate support from those who have first not been represented and are not on good terms with the taliban at this point of time that the representation has not taken place and the second of course that uh, th- th- those who are already jilted with the taliban that they have taken power will now actually have a, a certain level of uh, uh, interest in joining hands at some level to push back both politically and militarily against the taliban you have to remember despite the cabinet being announced the pushback has to be on these two front itself it cannot be just political because there is no political structure at this point of time mm-hmm. so uh, you know these i mean this i mean these points basically point towards a more fractured uh, way of how the taliban is going to consolidate power even further because you have to remember that when we are talking about the political process of the taliban it comes from largely comes from how they operate the shuras that's their sort of background of how they are trying to now are going to try to run this country as well right so it is not uh, not going to be um, you know what do you say as everyone was trying to look for an inclusive administration in any shape or form it is going to be uh, at some level top down and i do think as avinash also pointed out people like sirajuddin hakani and mulla yaqub are not in my opinion at least i could be wrong not going to become public figures by the by the next coming week they are going to operate through the shadows they are going to operate through kandahar most of the time uh, uh, while the political system tries to establish its supremacy within afghanistan which has yet to happen avinash what do you think uh, would be if any a change in taliban's thinking regarding pashtun nationalism given that one of the priorities for pakistan is of course cementing the durand line as the international boundary how do you think the taliban's coming to power how does it impact for example the pashtun tapuz movement or pashtun nationalism as a whole in pakistan that's an excellent question kriti i think one of the biggest successes of the taliban over the past two decades and i think we are kind of seeing this uh, in how the international opinion has manifested about the taliban itself has been uh this you know to keep both analysis and opinion completely off balance as to whether they are primarily pashtun nationalists uh with you know representing conservative islam as ambassador mukopadi indicated were was the case for taliban 1.0 or are they first and foremost radical islamists who happen to come from the pashtun kind of pashtun lands of afghanistan and pakistan i think uh as of now the strains of radicalism have actually increased over the past 20 years uh, i think they have instrumentalized pashtun nationalism to retain certain cohesion to manipulate and to manage intra tribal kind of politics and rivalries but at the same time the core ideological tenets come from you know it is an islamist movement first and foremost so there is a twin a kind of uh, effect of that feature right on one hand they will remain or they will have to kind of adopt a a policy of antagonism or silence on the durand line they cannot accept the durand line given the risk of that decision igniting pashtun sentiment uh, silence suits them not talking about it much not making that an issue in the near term with pakistan is something that suits them the second thing is and this is perhaps the reason why pakistan between 2017 and 2021 have actually fenced most of the border that regardless of what decision the taliban takes on the issue of the border or the boundary it is actually an ineffectual decision as far as rawalpindi and islamabad are concerned mm-hmm. because till the time they have de facto control over the border movement it does not matter what the pashtun nationalists actually have to say about that mm-hmm. uh, so they have kind of to some extent defanged 
that movement. You know, there is no, the, the kind of Pashtun nationalism we saw in the 70s and the 80s, right? Pre-communist, post-communist phase. I think what we see today, it's a shadow of that. On the issue of Pashtun Tahafuz movement, I think this will be a very complicated relationship. The PTM leadership and who have created new kind of political fronts, the NDM and others, you know, led by Mohsin Dawar, Afrasiyab Khatak, the senior kind of public intellectual, they have been very critical of the Taliban. This is not just because they are Pashtuns across the board, it does not mean that they see eye to eye on issues of politics, ideology, and governance, whether it's in Afghanistan or Pakistan. I do not see the Taliban having much love for the PTM and vice versa, because in many ways, the PTM has the potential if it really pushes the idea of Pashtun nationalism, which is secular in some broad sense, uh, to actually be a threat in an ideological sense to the Taliban's core ideological tenets as they stand. So I do not see uh, a very happy coexistence between these two ideas. ideas. And we have seen that kind of you know, uh, manifest themselves in very brutal kind of standoffs and kind of very uh, a, a lot of violence between the PTM and between the Awami National Party in Pakistan and in Khyber uh, and the Islamists that, that have operated out of Balochistan and, and even in, 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 in Waziristan. You know, there are, this is an intra-dynamic within the Pashtuns and it's a torn body politic. I, I do not see that uh, coexisting with comfort just because they are Pashtuns. Talking about a happy coexistence, Ruchi, let's talk a bit about the Tehri Ke Taliban Pakistan. Um, how do you see the recent attacks in Pakistan? Uh, do these sort of reflect any sort of change between the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistani Taliban? Um, would it increase in attacks in the TTP? Would it mean uh, that Pakistan has weaker influence over the Afghan Taliban because they can't rein in the TTP? Would less attacks mean that the Afghan Taliban wants to rein them in? How do you see the TTP now? Um, I do believe that the Afghan Taliban will try to uh, control the TTP and its influence in the region. I, I, I mean, I have no doubt that they are going to, um, because that's one way they can prove useful to the Pakistan, to their Pakistani, you know, uh, handlers that they that they uh, it want, it legitimizes their power if they are able to control the TTP. So I am sure they will try to do that. Um, they uh, with not with specifically TTP, but we are seeing them try and do that with the other um, other uh, fracture organization like today the son of uh, Mullah Manani. As he he um, used to the Taliban. It's a small faction that broke away from the Taliban. Um, they are and they were. Um, they they were seen. Um, they were they were boiler for the Taliban, but now they are, uh, they are part of the Taliban. They have you know they've been pledged allegiance to them. So um, and, and it's a, it's a very small example. I'm not I'm not comparing the two uh, movements, but uh, my point is that that the Taliban will try to, um, they will want to show themselves as uh, the leaders in in being able to control uh, the local insurgency. So there are a lot of they have they're going to face spoilers from like Daesh. They're going to face uh, face spoilers from IMU. They're going to but they're going to um, these um, uh, various insurgents, local insurgencies, uh, or they will try to, uh, you know, build uh, alliances and coalitions with them. So, mm -hmm. and, and just to, you know, give themselves more legitimacy and more, um, more, um, uh, you know, and the supremacy of, of, of insurgent organizations. Ambassador Mukhtar, your thoughts on the TTP and how do you see, um, sort of ISKP now, what are some of the challenges that the Islamic State poses to the Taliban? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, um, before I answer that question, may I just make two sort of resi residual points coming from uh, the earlier conversation. One is, you know, on this whole business about uh, changes in the Taliban, I left a little portion in incomplete. Clearly, we are seeing more diplomatic sophistication. One thing that I see is a difference is that unlike in the past, when they did not care about development, you know, now they obviously seem to want money, whether it is for development or whatever uh, else it may be, they seem to want ma money, value money. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why they are also interested in China, because they see China as one country that is willing to bring in money. Second, uh, the third, of course, you know, everybody knows on the propaganda, the narrative, the cyber, the use of deception as a tactic. I think all these things, uh, all these things continue. Uh, but uh, the basic point that, uh, and a point that I, where I see a little tension, is that the Chinese and Americans, you know, would like to reorient Afghanistan towards Central Asia, 
especially economically in China. Uh, whereas the Taliban, both Haqqani as well as uh, uh, Stanik Zai, have actually spoken about trade links with India because they know that the majority of the traders, uh, most of whom happen to be Pashtun traders from the Skandahar uh, belt and even from the Patia belt, uh, you know, their primary trade and uh, has been with India. So, you know, there's a very interesting kind of dynamic at work there. Uh, second, on this question that you asked, uh, um, uh, Avinash, you know, I think the whole purpose behind the creation of the Taliban, uh, not a perfect achievement, but the creation of the Taliban is that the Pakistani intent was to effectively create a group of Afghans, erase their Afghan identity, erase their Pashtun identity, externalize the Pashtun problem or dilute it to the extent possible. And uh, in fact, as uh, Avinash said, you know, given the choice between an emirate and Afghanistan, they have clearly not opted to reconcile with their fellow Afghans. They have opted to actually impose the emirate point of view. And this emirate point of view is actually a, a very interesting cover because to the extent that they, let's say tomorrow, uh, to accommodate, uh, you know, ethnics, Tajiks and Uzbeks, and, you know, they have accommodated some of them in the cabinet. The whole idea, particularly if those are from the Islamic Republic, the whole idea is to discredit them. And once they discredit them as ethnic leaders, in fact, use that as the peg or the Trojan horse to radicalize the ethnics and the, the ethnics also further, uh, you know. So I think this is a very calculated strategy to discredit uh, the ethnic leaders and anyone from the ethnic leaders or even the political leaders, uh, by the way, who about whom we have not heard anything about uh, Hikmatyar and Karzai and Abdullah, you know, their initiatives, we have not heard anything at all. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I wanted to make this point because I think, uh, you know, we shouldn't forget that it is primarily an attempt to drown uh, an Afghan and Pashtun identity in a larger Islamic identity. And that Emirates identity is, you know, not, notwithstanding what they may say that their interests are limited to Afghanistan. The fact is that they are so enmeshed with these other groups that have regional ambitions and also in, uh, international groups that have international ambitions. That means the Emirates provides a kind of blurred boundary, you know, in which the internationalist and regionalist groups can also uh, be active. Now, coming to your question on TTP, uh, you know, I respect very much Ruchi's view, uh, and I'm sure she has a great deal of ground feel. Uh, but I, I think, you know, we have to watch this. I don't know enough about this, but one thing I will say is that when they freed the prisoners in the uh, uh, in the jails, uh, they freed as many or more uh, TTP uh, elements. Uh, and already the TTP elements have gone back and they have united with their uh, comrades and, you know, they are likely to create problems. On the other hand, you know, if you see their control of the, the Haqqani's control of the, uh, the, uh, the interior ministry, the ND, NDS, and all these data banks that the Americans have created, you know, these uh, biometric data banks that they have created, clearly the ISI will now have access to information about individuals. Uh, which will enable them to uh, act, control and perhaps act upon them much better because they'll have, you know, a whole treasure trove of intelligence gathered by the NDS and by the Americans over a period of time. So I think that is, I think this, this, this question I can't answer clearly. I think it's very murky, uh, mm -hmm. but I think we need to look out at, uh, you know, all these aspects as well. I want to get to uh, what India's relations with, with Afghanistan would be. But before that, Avinash, I just wanted to get your take on the TTP. How do you see sort of the TTP targeting uh, Chinese projects in the country? How do the Baloch figure into it? And of course, how what does that mean for sort of TTP and Afghan-Taliban relations? Thank you, Kriti. Just uh, two finger on that. I wanted to come in on. I mean, I this I I completely see where you know both Kriti and Ambassador Mukhopadhyay are coming for, from, right? You know, there is an incentive for the Afghan Taliban to crack down on TTP. They might do it selectively. It's a very difficult space to to kind of uh, to accurately pinpoint which direction this will go. But all the trends suggest that the Afghan Taliban till now have actually strengthened the TTP, not weakened them. Whatever they might say overtly. Uh, they have actually fed into empowered TTP rank and file. You know, some of the most uh, some of the most 
uh, operationally capable commanders have actually been released. They went against and targeted about eight ISKP leaders uh, when the, they were trying to escape the prisons or were being tactically released. Um, but TTP, they did not touch any TTP figure despite knowing full well who they're releasing from the prisons uh, over the past one month. And I think that itself is a very strong signal. The second thing is the Haqqani network actually has a very strong history of relationship with the tehreek e taliban Pakistan. The two coexist. So let's, I mean, for me, you know, Haqqanis are not a fam that family and its networks, traditionally a criminal syndicate, is not someone on which the ISI can put all the controls, even if the relationship is very strong. This is a group that can assert itself. It has the levers to assert itself, if not, you know, to some extent uh, in demanding, making its demands, um, asserting its demands vis-a-vis -vis the ISI. And the TTP is a tool. It's a leverage. You know, the Haqqanis will utilize, especially the fact that they are, you know, they're leading the interior ministry. That actually gives them considerable leverage, if not for the people of Afghanistan, at least for their own parochial interests. Uh, and perhaps when the negotiation was going on in Kabul about what the cabinet would be, you can see a very clear uptick in TTP attacks. And since then, we haven't seen, a, I mean, over the last couple of days, we haven't seen any attack as of now being reported by the TTP. So I would be, I, I am inclined, I'm of the view that this is going to enable and strengthen these Islamists across the board. And the incentive structures of it might seem on the face of it. Thank you. Kabir, besides the fact that uh, the Taliban are backed by the Pakistan and their victory gives Islamabad and Rawalpindi a strong foothold in the country, um, on a very basic level, what are the base biggest challenges for India as we go ahead and sort of battle this question of how to engage the new regime on whether we should engage the new regime. We know that the Taliban uh, were the ones who reached out to Ambassador Mittal and they were the ones who wanted to talk. Um, and yes, of course, we should have a healthy skepticism for what the Taliban say. But how should we, how should New Delhi be viewing the Taliban at this stage? Look, uh, it's really difficult to say right now because, you know, everyone you ask at the moment is going to say yeah, it's a wait and watch game, right? So like you can't, come to conclusive decision making right now considering you know they've just announced their cabinet and you still don't know what it's going to be because it's interim and so on and so forth mm -hmm. but uh, the the thing is that i don't think it was it 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 needed to be a wait and watch game throughout the process the process has been a long long uh, you know uh, way, a long way in the making and there were ample opportunities for india to insert itself you know we kept on hearing things like uh, india was not invited to xyz table or abc table but the, pro but the point was that why did India need an invitation to begin with? And uh, the second very quick point I want to make it look at some level, I'm sure, you know, the Indians had been engaging with, with the Taliban, uh, 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 you know, both from the Doha process level um, and from uh, a strategic level, sort of talking directly on the ground in Afghanistan. At, at a point of time when uh, people like Mullah Brother and so on were actually not traveling around, um, around uh, uh, Afghanistan. So I'm sure those outreaches were at play at some level. To what end, you know, it's very difficult to say. But uh, uh, all these, uh, you know, all these wheels uh, would have been in motion at some at some point of time. India's core concerns are, of course, I think two. two. Um, one is, of course, uh, relating to its own security when it comes to issues such as Kashmir and 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 uh, Afghanistan becoming a safe haven for groups such as Lashkar Taiba and Jashe Mohammed. Uh, but also AQIS, for example, uh, uh, you know, and, and ISKP. So all of it, uh, you know, is going to affect South Asia the most. Uh, you, at the moment, you know, the West can you can point towards the distance between itself and Afghanistan and that, and maybe it's correct. You know, they're not actually going to get directly affected for at least uh, some time before the, a lot of these ecosystems that were uh, severely hampered over the past two decades, you know, uh, try to rebuild themselves. But we saw that, you know, the one of the first... Uh, congratulatory messages that came for the Taliban after they took over Kabul were from uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates that included Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, the Arabian Peninsula and, 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 and from, the, uh, from the Sinai region and from the Africa region. So, you know, that shows that, you know, the affiliates are, are uh, of course, you maybe not, uh, you may, uh, not, may not have heard from people like Zawahiri at this point of time, but, uh, but the affiliates were very quick to, very quick to congratulate the the uh, the Taliban regime and equally the ISKP was quick to condemn the trial and uh, condemn the uh, the Taliban regime. So that shows that you know that these groups, if not operationally at least, are sort of in like 
you know on tune with what is happening in afghanistan right now and as as and when they start seeing uh, vacuums which they will very soon uh, they will try and start installing themselves within the capacity that they had built uh, previously you know it, even if the americans are saying uh, the al qaeda is gone uh, i highly doubt that uh, there is any you know reality behind it and very quickly you know on the iskp uh, question also the people um, very you know there is there is a tendency of uh, equating the iskp to the islamic state and what happened in syria and iraq iskp is is a stitched up uh, group of afghan and pakistan militias itself and terror groups itself they're not from anywhere else they largely when it was started it was uh, uh, it was handled by three commanders one was tajik one was uzbek and one was former ttp that's where it started and uh, you know the the, the pakistani uh, security establishment tried to uh, uh, interfere in this initial stitch up very early in the game in 2014 15 itself and sort of uh, you know broke them up a little bit at that point of time but now uh, as we are seeing the taliban uh, not being very um, you know, quote unquote inclusive in their in their political architecture i think a lot of the groups that may have cut deals with the taliban only from a tactical security point point of view are going to look for alternatives to make sure that their interests and their um, tribes their populations that they uh, hover over uh, are not subjected to a, an overwhelming uh, political and military uh, architecture of the taliban mm -hmm. master mukhopadhyay your thoughts on what kabir just said and also what are the options now going forward for india in terms of working with countries in the region our traditional allies of course have sort of changed their relationship with the taliban what does this mean regarding how we should be engaging with the group should do we no longer have the same interests as them uh, do we need to look for new allies your thoughts yeah okay just one uh, passing point on the isk i think kabir knows a lot more about it than me uh, but uh, i do want to point out that you know while there are differences in tactics and techniques and even turf uh, issues as well as uh, targets uh, sometimes the division between is and taliban Uh, particularly the is and hakani network has been far too clean uh, and let's just take the kabul airport attacks you know hakani network was in charge of the security and the attacks took place and the isk p was blamed now either uh, they were in collusion or they were inefficient either way it is very bad news so you know i i would take and there are uh, there are documented links between isi elements let elements imu elements iskp elements elements of the ttp who and the taliban who have defected from nangarhar area and all that so i would say that you know this whole iskp um uh, taliban uh, kind of di divergence or uh, contest should be taken with a bit of a pinch of salt there is contest but there is also areas of uh, coordination and actually the mastermind may be a third party which is uh, behind it. then on this whole question you know i um, uh, i think you know there has to be a certain minimal pragmatic engagement uh, with those elements of the taliban we have been talking in to ensure our sort of minimal security needs whether it is uh, you know all the things that kabir said but i think on the whole we were right uh, i mean there are issues there we were right in not legitimizing the taliban during the uh, you know process of coming to power and now that they have come to power i don't think there is any particular logic in surrendering the credit that we got unlike the rest of the world you should remember that the rest of the world engaged the taliban to do deals behind the backs of the afghan state and afghan people uh, and in their own narrow selfish interest uh, i think selfish interest is good up to a point but if interests are mutual if they are joint if they are hand in hand with the afghan people in this case then i think your you are taking care of your interests far better uh, so i would say that you know what we have to see are two things one is the whole range from good case scenario to uh, to worst case scenario good case scenario is inclusive government uh, everybody is included the taliban are magnanimous in victory and everybody lives happily ever after which will not happen it's a fantasy anyone who believes that is a fantasy the worst case scenario in which in my view is much more likely you know given some of the things kabir also just said um is that you will have a libya syria uh, iraq kind of scenario uh, where you will have multitude of extremist radical terrorist outfits of various kinds as well as resistance war uh, on the one hand i mean on the other hand all fighting 
for uh, space in Afghanistan. Uh, and there is an interim place, which is, you know, like a kind of more secular resistance or a civil war involving uh, the, the, a national uprising on the one hand, but also, uh, you know, ethnic fault lines on the other. And, you know, people like Bismillah Khan have already talked about the possibility of the division of the country. And by the way, talk about division of Afghanistan amongst Tajik, Hazaras and Uzbeks uh, has grown in the last five years that I have been watching Afghanistan. What didn't used to be uttered is now talked about openly. And there are political philosophers justifying it in, uh, abroad as well. Uh, so I would say that as far as we are concerned, you know, we also have the range of options going from uh, minimal engagement for the most pragmatic considerations. I would say whatever we do, we stop short of legit legitimization. Uh, humanitarian needs are very important. We should try and route, route it through UN specialized organizations as we have done even during the 2001-21 period through the WFP and other such organizations. And we should keep the option of hosting people who belong to the new generation, the post-2001 generation, to keep the idea of the republic alive and even go to the extent of supporting the resistance and going further, even uh, uh, accepting an, uh, 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 an exile, a government in exile in Afghanistan. Because if you ask me, the heart and soul of the Afghan people are the same values that people fought for, for the French Revolution, for the American War of Independence, for, the, for India's independence, which is essentially values of freedom. And th that value of freedom is not going to die. You have to decide whether you want your diplomacy based on people, progressive uh, run of people, or on expedient considerations of expediency and the power of the state. And I feel that it's a much stronger bet in the long run to bet on uh, people, not expediency. Expediency is very close to opportunism. Opportunism is not a policy. So I think I'll end with that because I have a uh, an appearance with uh, uh, India Today, Rahul Kavala. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sushant, and thank you for thank you all of you for uh, well, uh, bearing with me. And bye. Ruchi, I saw that you were sort of agreeing with Ambassador Mukhopadhyay um, and his I, statements. What is your view I, on what India's interests, yes, engagements, what sort of steps should the government be making now? Um, should we be still sort of engaging with the group in terms of continuing the good work we have been doing in the country, continuing to help the Afghan people? What does the nature of that engagement look like? So uh, I agree with the uh, ambassador on the, the part where he said that uh, uh, it was good that we did not engage with the Taliban during the process, um, which was a very, um, which was a very wise move. It put us like, you know, put us one step, you know, ahead of everybody. It, was a, it gave us a moral standing. Uh, but what we failed to do and what uh, we should have done was back the Republic a lot more. Uh, of course, we should be supporting the values of the Republic right now, but there was a point in time when the Republic used, could have used allies and India was not India was not really there for for what you know. I mean, of course, we've done a lot of de uh, development work. We we have a lot of investments. We have supported the military uh, in you know in parts. Um, but uh, I know for a fact that the um, the um, the allies that are the sorry the resistance forces. The many of the leaders of the resistance forces have uh, over the last couple of years, particularly, tried to reach out to the Indian officials. They've tried to reach mm -hmm. out to Indian the Ministry of External Affairs, and they were not entertained. Uh, they were looking for support uh, in the region. They were looking for allies, and we were not there uh, to support their claims or to support their you know stance. And 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 I have like you know it it was uh, it was a very frustrating. Um, um, it was a very frustrating experience for a lot of officials that I talked to who tried to, who would through me try to arrange um, interviews with the, or the, you know, meetings with the, uh, with the ambassador, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Vinay Kumar, and I did not know Mr. Vinay. They, they, you know, it's basically their senior officials who who could not reach Indian officials when they needed them, and um, it's a little too late for us. But now, also, of course, yes, we should be supporting the the values of the republic. But when India had a chance to actually be part of the negotiation. 
negotiations or to be part of the settlement process, uh, we did not really take the chance. Um, and I feel like that, I'm not saying that India being part of the settlement could have saved the collapse of the current structure, but you never know that, you know, maybe India, India's presence, maybe India's involvement in the process could have actually saved a bit of the structure, helped with the uh, political settlement, helped perhaps, you know, uh, move to a transitional government, which kind of sort of protects some values of the republic, which are all all gone right now. Um, the resistance, yes, still is looking for support, and you know they they are appealing to all the UN, the international uh, bodies, and and it it's much harder to support them right now. But uh, these are the very same people who reached out to India a couple of years ago, and we did not respond to them the way we should have. Um, so we did, and we we're going to pay a heavy price for it because, like Ambassador said, this or like everybody else in the panel said, this will empower the Islamist movements in South Asia, which will affect us. Um, the our support for the Republic of Afghanistan was not just for their values but it was for our own security and we and and you know I am concerned that this will uh, result in you know more empowered Islamist movements uh, across South Asia across India particularly so uh, so yeah of course yeah we should still be we should you know there's still time we should still be uh, protecting you know helping uh, the Afghans stuck in India right now. There's okay. There's a widespread sense of betrayal, which I have sensed in the last one month. Which I've you know, which I've personally experienced in in the last one month. I've personally been at the receiving end of many many angry emails, messages from you know, uh, from Afghan government officials who spoke on behalf of India, who thought India was an ally, who thought India would help them, and now they're in hiding and they are being hunted by the Taliban and um, they've reached out to Indian government officials, they've reached out to former ambassadors and former embassy officials asking to be asking to be saved because their lives are at risk and India has not even replied to their emails. India has not even approved uh, approved the visas, the emergency visas that we were we, we promised them or we said we would. Um, there were a couple of evacuation flights, but that's about it. There was no effort made to, you know, co collaborate with the, the US and the UK and the other countries that were conducting evacuations. Um, we did not even evacuate all of the Afghan Hindus and Sikhs that we wanted to save. So, I mean, the other Afghan civil society, uh, you know the the young the community community you know he did that the India supported uh, nobody was uh, so I mean we there's still scope there's still you know scope for improvement there's still potential but like not, nothing has been done yet so we're I'm not impressed with that uh, that end of our engagement with with Afghanistan yeah fair enough Kabir your thoughts on what Ruchi said is is what India did too little too late and you were also talking a little bit about AQIS before, which I think is important. So also, what does the Taliban victory mean for India vis-a-vis -vis AQIS? What does it mean for their sort of dream of Gazwa and Hind? Your thoughts? Uh, look, uh, it's very difficult to say because uh, Al-Qaeda messaging is always very difficult to decipher beyond the point, right? One day they'll say something and the other day they completely say something else, uh, depending on what agency is saying what, right? So, for example, of course, the AQIS congratulated um, uh, uh, the Taliban on its victory. But AQIS, for example, uh, today or yesterday also, uh, you know, uh, released a message on the passing of uh, SS Gilani in Kashmir uh, on, on, on sort of what kind of... Uh, the role he played in Kashmir. So, uh, you know, operationally, they, AQIS has like never really been a big player, all said and done. Uh, it, 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 that includes its uh, affiliates in, in, in the valley. But uh, uh, the, the, the victory in Afghan, the whole sort of, you know, the concept of, uh, of uh, the Taliban being victorious may actually embolden at least some factions of the Al-Qaeda to, to uh, operationalize on a larger level. And very quickly on uh, on uh, uh, some things that Ruchi said on, you know, I think um, one of the biggest uh, investments India made in Afghanistan over the past 20 years with, uh, was with the Afghan people, right? So we, uh, uh, I mean, most of the developmental work that India did it was directly in benefit of, of the Afghan people. So uh, at this point of time, I think India should op uh, work uh, with uh, international partners and the United Nations to use the already existing and operating, uh, you know, humanitarian air corridor and start uh, start uh, with, with some uh, maybe flights with supplies and medicines for the Afghan people. I think that will go a long, long way. Uh, what Ruchi said on a sense of 
loss and betrayal of the Indian presence in Afghanistan is true. Uh, it started uh, it started a bit uh, before when the Taliban was sort of uh, you know going through its paces ar- across Afghanistan, but really cemented itself once the India Indian embassy closed down. So I think uh, the the uh, the uh, humanitarian air corridor is something that the United Nations is also using. So there's no harm in sort of you know, you know you're not going to lose any any uh, space uh, if you're going to operationalize some uh, humanitarian flights into Kabul right now. Mm-hmm. Abhinash, I'll give you the final word. Um, Pakistan is this, of course, as we discussed earlier, this highly effective PR machine. The fact that everyone in the US, um, in the West, allies, they sort of know what Pakistan is doing, repeatedly know it, and yet choose to ignore it, um, has been largely the reason for why we're discussing what it is we're, that we're discussing today. Going forward, give us some positive news. Is there any room for any sort of optimism now that the U.S. have left Afghanistan, that the West will not keep their eyes wide shut regarding Pakistan's double game? Or is that sort of just still delusional thinking on our part that things will change? I'm sorry, Kriti. Let me just uh, very uh, at the beginning kind of, you know, uh, say I don't have much good news unfortunately on this count. I think Pakistan will actually ironically become even more important for the West given the fact that they'll become the key, they have positioned themselves as the key interlocutor uh, between the Taliban and the world at large, right? Uh, and this is visible not just with Faiz Hamid's visit, but also the fact that every country, including, you know, intelligence chiefs, you know, Bill Burns and the British intelligence chief, the Russian intelligence chief, a visit to Islamabad to figure out how to even uh, undertake basic evacuation right now. So Pakistan's role, and I think they have done this, they, they've done it knowingly, right? This is not that they have not been unaware of Pakistan will remain essential. Uh, you know, the negative value that Pakistan brings to to board for its great powers, that shall remain and might even increase in a different tangent given the larger Sino-US competition and the Sino-Quad competition that we are talking about in the Indo-Pacific and abroad. The last point, the one point I want to kind of make on the issue of India and Afghanistan, you know, and this sense of loss, the sense of betrayal. Now, uh, the Pashtuns felt betrayed by India at, after partition because they didn't want to be part of Pakistan, but the Congress gave up. Then Daud Khan felt betrayed by India because he wanted to kind of push the Pashtun nationalist cause and Pashtunistan cause. But Indira Gandhi, despite having succeeded in Bangladesh, failed to support or did decided not to support. Then uh, Najib and the rest of the Afghan government and people of Afghanistan felt a sense of betrayal from India in 1992 when India went and started talking to the Mujahideen. So this sense, then the Northern Alliance guys started feeling betrayed when India started talking to the Karzai, uh, to Karzai and the government after post-2001. This is static. This is a continuity. Given the fact that India is a, not, is a peripheral player in Afghanistan, that betrayal, that sense of loss is actually as much part of India's presence in Afghanistan as much is the goodwill that India enjoys. And both aspects will remain uh, as we move forward. Let's be very clear about that. And the second point is the key driver of, uh, of India's Afghanistan policy post-independence and not just in the last 20 years is essentially to counterbalance Pakistan. India will do whatever is needed to counterbalance Pakistan. And if that remain, if that means using humanitarian aid that Kabir has recommended, uh, you know, and even Ambassador Mukhopadhyay was, talk- was talking about, you know, investing in the people, is India to deal with the Afghan Taliban? I think that is likely to happen. Uh, I don't think that is something that New Delhi will overlook in a in a for a long a period, it's simply because New Delhi cannot leave that space empty. And the moment it goes partisan against Taliban now, uh, it will actually close whatever possibilities there might be, uh, however, you know, in, in the coming months or years. So I think it's, it's a very grim situation, unfortunately. I don't have many much positive news to share. But I personally foresee, even if I don't agree in principle and given my own political mind, uh, I foresee India dealing with the Taliban in some which way or the other, much short of recognition, but much more than what the situation is as of now. Mm-hmm. Well, to sort of use an overused cliche that sort of sums up what Abhinash said, there are no end games in Afghanistan and the future of Afghanistan remains unclear. The Taliban will continue to sort of balance their need for international legitimacy and recognition with their radical Islamist thinking. Afghanistan's neighbors will continue to balance their strategic interests over their moral imperatives. 
the Afghan people, of course, will hopefully continue their resistance, whatever form that may take in the coming weeks. And how New Delhi chooses to or does not choose to engage with the Taliban will have a direct impact on its national security. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Warak's going to continue to have more conversations on Afghanistan in the coming weeks. So I hope you tune in for those. Thank you very much.